Okay, so let's get started. There's lots of information, but it's a it's the funnest field, so you'll have lots of fun this morning. Okay. Okay. So beginning um, the the talk. Um, because you don't have a neurosurgery component to um, to this review course, but neurosurgical questions come up frequently, structural and other abnormalities, um, it's included here. And we're starting with congenital um, anomalies, okay? And the most um, frequent and important one that you're going to see uh, is neural tube defects. Remember um, that neural tube defects occur in the first trimester, and that's why there's all of that um, emphasis on um, folate supplementation early on, um, and why the public health um, movement has, has brought um, forth folate supplementation. And remember that um, there are several stages, multiple stages in um, in the formation of the neural tube, um, starting with, um, let me see if I can use my finger as my mouse, um, the, uh, the um, coming of the neural plate um, together with the uh, formation of the neural groove and the neural tube finally. This you don't have to memorize. This is just to remind you that, um, that there's a progression and that that progression and I'll show you on the next picture, finishes um, by about the fourth week. Um, um, you'll see the picture here. And this gives you a, an anatomical um, sense of why things happen with neural tube defects that we're going to talk about. Um, because early you have the neural plate forming, then you have a neural groove, um, and then you have the, um, the closure of the caudal and the cranial um, ends. So what neural tube defects are, are there? There are anterior and there are posterior defects. Remember that anencephaly and encephalocele are associated, are anterior defects, whereas posterior defects, um, the posterior defect that you need to know about is spina bifida. There's a picture right here of a uh, meningocele. Um, and encephaly. Now, you're not going to be taking care of a lot of these babies because it's not compatible with life, um, but in the nursery room, it may be something that you, um, you deal with. And remember that it's, um, it's relatively a common one to four in 1,000 live births, and it is a failure of closure, again, of the anterior neural tube. This is an example of anencephaly. Remember that there are associated malformations of the face and the eyes, and um, for prenatal diagnosis, that alpha fetoprotein is important the diagnosis, okay? Um, encephalocele is rarer, um, uh, 0.1 per 1,000 live births. And what's important about encephalocele, here's a little picture of it right here, an MRI, a fetal MRI, where you see an outpouching. This is a, an extreme example, but you see an outpouching out the occipit. Um, and and what, um, what this demonstrates is that most of the encephalocele that you will see or hear about are going to be occipital. And again, the prenatal diagnosis is through a, a, um, AFP. See this theme there? Again, you guys will remember that AFP is, um, is, the, is what you need to use for prenatal diagnosis. Remember that it, 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 it's a herniation and it is through a skull defect, whereas when you're dealing with spina bifida, it's down the spine. Okay, let's talk about different types of spina bifida. And the one that you'll remember um, that um, is seen relatively frequently is spina bifida occulta. The question that you're going to see on examinations that, um, that you, um, you want to remember, they're not going to say, here's a picture of spina bifida occulta, what is it? They're going to ask you a they're going to show you a picture of, say, a hairy patch. They may um, indicate something about a lipoma, okay? Um, or skin color changes, or show you a dermal sinus and say, what is this associated with? Remember that spina bifida occulta, from the name, is that it is a hidden defect in the fusion of the vertebral um, body. Um, there is no protrusion of the spinal cord and meninges. You just see it, it's hidden, and you see a little tuft of hair, or sometimes the indication is a lipoma or, um, or a, um, a discoloration of the skin. Um, what are the associations? Remember that can, it can be associated with syringomyelia. And um, for um, those who uh, don't remember what syringomyelia is, syrinx is, um, is basically enlargement of the central canal of the, uh, of the spinal cord. And when it um, enlarges in a pathologic fashion, it is a syringomyelia. 
this is a, um, another favorite one to pronounce, um, and you get 10 points if you can pronounce it. Diastematomyelia, which basically in doctor talk or it means a splitting of the spinal cord, so a double spinal cord. Um, why is it important? You may never see this, but this is the kind of thing that people like to ask you on examinations. What are the associated findings with spina bifida occulta? And tethered cord is probably the most common one, and that's one you really want to think about, okay? Um, okay, so we're, we're moving right on with spina bifida. Remember that it's a relatively common, um, common uh, congenital anomaly, and this is something that you're going to see very frequently in your pediatric practice. Um, uh, but the important thing for examinations is um, there, there are going to be questions about um, what's the recurrence risk? How are you going to counsel families? Because these are things in general that families want to know. So remember that there is an increased risk with subsequent siblings of 4%. You go from 1 to 2 per 1,000, so 0.1% to 4% in subsequent siblings. If you have two previously affected siblings, um, the risk is 10%. So remember the, um, the escalating risk as um, time moves on. And then remember also one of the drugs that we love to hate is valproic acid, and it is associated with, um, with neural tube defects. And so that is a very, very um, common thing that examiners like to ask you questions about. They like to ask you questions about things that, um, that you might do that could cause harm down the line. And we do take care of teenagers, um, as everyone knows. And, not, and um, the last teenager I checked with didn't know um, she was pregnant until she had her baby. So remember that. OK? Um, folic acid um, uh, supplementation, again, it's going, going to be something that um, it's, it's unlikely that doses will actually be on um, your examination, but just remember that folic acid supplementation is something that um, will reduce the risk by about half, um, and um, that um, for your own um, for your own practice, you can give 0.4 milligrams per day um, before conception to four weeks. And if there's a previous uh, um, affected sibling, up to four milligrams a day um, is used. Um, and also think about that carefully when you're giving, um, when you have to give agents such as valproic acid, which um, may be associated with neural tube defects, and always um, supply with, supplement with folic acid um, in those cases, okay? Myelomeningocele, that was the picture um, that we saw earlier. Uh, remember that this is a defect in the, um, the covering of the, um, the spinal cord and that um, the important thing to remember about this is that there's exposure and infection risk. Um, the other important thing to remember uh, for examination purposes is that um, there are associated findings. Again, remember examiners love to think about associations. They'll give you a scenario of a picture of a, a child with a certain problem and ask you what might this be associated with as well. Because what the examiners want to know is as, as a pediatrician, you're not just going to admire something, but you're going to think about what it's associated with. And in this case, remember hydrocephalus and Chiari 2 malformations. Um, uh, we'll go over Chiari malformations later on in the talk, so don't be scared of that. Just remember it's hydrocephalus in two, not one. Okay? What are they gonna? What are kids with spina bifida gonna look like? These are kids that you see all the time in your practice. Um, so re just remember that um, the reflexes are decreased, not increased. Okay? <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and because of the, um, excuse me. <coughs> Because of the um, the fact that it's a congenital um, abnormality of the um, of the uh, um, of the and ex with exposure of the spinal cord and the roots, um, you are going to have um, club feet and hip subluxation. Survival is very high, and remember also that intelligence is normal in the majority of survivors. It's just a mechanical problem. Okay, the um, spinal cord is open and, and exposed, um, and then there's some downward herniation um, of the contents. But um, meningocele, on the other hand, is, is much less common. This may appear, and the, the only difference is that um, all that's um, protruding is the meninges. The meningeal sac is protruding through the bony defect. Um, remember also um, that if you have a CSF leak, uh, you will want to um, repair it with surgery. Um, 
uh, neurosurgery should be involved in all of these cases. And again, um, you know, the kinds of things that examiners want to look at is, are you going to be a, pra a safe practicing physician? And so if the question is, you know, um, what should you do in neurosurgery is one of the choices that is something that you really want to have involved um, with your kids with spina bifida. Okay, as promised, Chiari malformations. Um, we love to hate Chiari 1 malformations because they're seen so frequently. Um, as neurologists, we do a lot of MRI scans and um, and uh, we, uh, as we have increased in the frequency of the MRI scans we've done, I think that the um, awareness of Chiari 1 mal malformations or calling Chiari 1 malformations is more and more. The rules for Chiari malformations, see this right here? What's that called? <laughs> This is where you can answer me. The frame and magnum, right? Okay, and so the rule for Chiari malformations, as you recall, is that it, the protrusion of the cerebellar tonsils uh, is 0 0.5 centimeters below the frame and magnum. You draw a line right here, and you um, and you measure. And if it's more than 0 0.5 centimeters, then you've got a Chiari malformation. What's important, again, associated finding, syrinx is extremely common um, in Chiari malformations. And so when you have a child with a Chiari malformation, um, you don't just want to um, sit back and admire it, but you want to think, what are the associated findings um, that, um, that might lead to intervention? And a syrinx is one. So um, remember to get a cord image um, if you have a child with a Chiari malformation. What are the symptoms? Now remember, um, I just said Chiari malformations are extremely common. Um, there are some that need intervention um, or that might warrant intervention. The majority um, need no intervention at all. If there are no symptoms, um, very few neurosurgeons would be interested in doing surgery. However, because the brain stem is being pressed on, there can be a lot of brain stem signs, dysphagia, vertigo, ataxia, headache, neck pain, and so on. So what are the things that you might get in a, in a clinical scenario on an examination? Um, you might be asked a question, um, uh, 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 be asked a question in which a child is said to have a Chiari malformation, and then um, um, he uh, has sleep problems. And the question would be, what would be the common associated finding? And that would be a central sleep apnea. So in these kids with Chiari malformation, remember to do a polysomnogram um, to, uh, to evaluate um, about whether there is a, a significant medical problem associated with it. Um, and um, in another scenario, you may be asked about que questions about headaches and associated with Chiari malformation. Remember the, that lots and lots of kids get headaches um, and lots and lots of kids have Chiari malformations. Not all headaches that are associated with Chiari malformations are, um, are suggestive of the Chiari malformation causing the headache. The headache is, should be occipital may be associated with neck pain, um, and may be associated with, um, with worsening, with increases in Valsalva maneuver, um, with jumping up and down. Um, and those are the things that you might want to ask to elicit a further history as to whether the Chiari malformation is significant, okay? Um, <clears throat> remember the, the procedure of choice is a sub suboccipital decompression, um, and it's um, for an, uh, it's, uh, for a neurosurgeon, a relatively straightforward procedure. Don't ask me to do the procedure, um, but um, um, the, a neurosurgeon will certainly do the procedure um, if necessary. Okay, um, so we talked earlier about Chiari, uh, we mentioned Chiari 2 malformations. Remember that the fourth ventricle and medulla are below the foramen magnum with a Chiari 2 malformation. So you have tonsillar herniation with Chiari 1, with Chiari 2, the num as the numbers get bigger, the herniation gets lower. What's special about a Chiari 2? That the fourth ventricle um, is actually um, involved and 
and subsequent or as a result of this, what do you get? You get hydrocephalus because you have obstruction now of the fourth ventricle. And the symptoms are the same, lower cranial nerve and brainstem type symptoms. Um, but the important associated symptom is that um, you will have hydrocephalus. And the other important association, which you saw on the slide before, is that um, myelomeningocele may be associated. So if you get the, the more, more likely scenario is that you'll get a picture of a my, myelomeningocele seal and the question will be what can this be associated with and you want always want to think if you see a myelomeningocele seal that you're going to look for hydrocephalus and you're going to look for a Chiari 2 because that's where you might need acute um, intervention. Okay, Chiari 3, and that's, um, that's the last of the Chiaris, is herniation even further. And if you look, this is the foramen magnum here, and you see the cerebellum actually herniating. Um, it's associated um, with higher lesions, uh, cervical spina bifida and occipital encephalocele. The likelihood that you'll see something about Chiari 3 is much lower than Chiari 1 or 2, okay? Okay, um, so I'll pause here to make sure that everyone's heard everything. Everyone's heard everything, everyone's on board. No areas of confusion. You're good? Okay, let's move on. Um, these are other um, congenital abnormalities that may appear on your examination. Clipal fill is a, uh, constitutes a triad. This is a picture to, to remind you of where the primary abnormality uh, is seen, and that's in the cervical spine, and it's really fusion of the bone to the C-spine, um, which leads to uh, appearance of a short neck limited neck motion, and low occipital hairline. There are multiple um, uh, anomalies that are associated with clipal feel, um, including, including deaf, deafness, macrocephaly, hydrocephalus, meningocele, mental retardation, MSK problems, cardiac and GU problems. But for your purposes, just remember the, uh, the triad of associations and that it's really, it's fusion of the, uh, the cervical spine. Um, Okay, moving on to hydrocephalus. This is really important. And one of the things about, um, about examinations is examiners want to really understand where, um, uh, where the uh, fatal errors might be, where you might miss something. And so um, emergency situations such as increased ICP and hydrocephalus are really important, things you don't want to miss in the emergency room. So um, what do you guys see here? Is that a brain or an eye? <laughs> okay, good. Okay, and, and, and I heard some answers. What was uh, papilledema? Okay, so um, disc edema, okay, an abnormal appearance. Um, it could be due, um, you don't want to always think this is due to increased ICP. Remember that it can be due to, um, to inflammation of the optic nerve or a papillitis. Um, but, um, but remember, always, always, always to look at the eye if you have a child that presents with vomiting and headache. Um, um, on your examination, you may see uh, a clinical presentation um, with, uh, with a child that may or may not have a picture of uh, papilledema but comes in with headache and vomiting and uh, perhaps is, um, is declining in terms of level of consciousness. He or she may pay attention to the vitals because the vitals are very important and remember about Cushing's triad because that'll help you to identify identify increased ICP. Clinically, you know, when you're working in the ICU or you're working in the emergency room or you're looking at a child anyway, this is important. So remember that the triad is bradycardia, hypertension, and the last stage of it is irregular breathing. If you just get those two, the bradycardia and hypertension, really think carefully about whether you've got um, someone with increased ICP. Um, and if you have this, um, what do you not want to do? This and this. A tap, yeah, don't do a tap or you might have a catastrophe on hand, right? You might, this uh, child might already be starting to cone and you could um, help that person along, which is something you do not want to do. Okay, what are the other more subtle signs? Remember, um, on a clinical scenario, you may get a child that's got postural headaches that feels better with lying down um, and early morning headaches. Um, the the um, other important um, 
physical examination sign the child may present with is a six nerve palsy. Remember that the six nerve palsy presents with diplopia. So the history you may get may be that a child presents with diplopia and vomiting and you don't get examination findings. But remember that that can be a six nerve pal palsy and that is a false localizing sign, meaning it doesn't tell you that the lesion is not in the brain stem, it is due to increased ICP. Okay, and of course, papilledema. Okay, you guys know all of the reasons for increased ICP. I put this on for you just to look at and think about um, before your examination. Um, and it really, um, it, what it demonstrates is that you can have either um, uh, communicating or non-communicating uh, communicating hydrocephalus um, and that you want to look everywhere that CSF flow can be obstructed um, to think about where your lesion is. Um, most frequently you're going to find the lesion somewhere around the fourth ventricle in the posterior fossa in the pediatric population, although you can get surprised um, by multiple different things. Um, and remember also in those premature babies that the reason for hydrocephalus is, um, is different and it's a failure of, of reabsorption of CSF and it's um, um, due to the poor, poor absorption or reabsorption of the arachnoid granules. Okay. How do you treat, um, how do you treat uh, hydrocephalus? Well, um, acutely, um, remember we, we uh, the acute management um, would um, is not listed here, but remember to raise the head of the bed. Um, if uh, you're thinking about a therapeutic um, intervention and you're pretty sure that you have hydrocephalus, don't forget about mannitol um, as, as an option. Um, and um, um, in terms of if you have a mass, of course, um, you're going to want to treat the underlying cause. This probably will not appear in examination because it's pretty obvious. Um, but um, think also about a VP shunt. Acutely, you want to have a, you, you may um, be dealing with an EVD from neurosurgery. And again, this is something that neurosurgery should be involved in. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so that's really increased ICP. Remember then, with increased ICP, you're going to want to review the emergency management and the recognition of increased ICP and the fatal flaw that you don't want to do, as you guys all said and know, um, is that you're not going to tap this child, okay? Um, let's move on to migrational disorders. Um, this will re represent a smaller proportion of your examination. Um, so I, I'll show you some nice pictures, um, but um, I think, you know, if you're going to concentrate your time on things, I think really concentrating on, on things that will, um, um, that are um, interventional management type questions is, is where you want to concentrate your time. But don't ignore these. You may get pictures on this. Listen cephaly. Okay. This is not very common, but something examiners love to show pictures of because it's got really cool pictures. Okay. Um, and it's and it's an important and interesting phenomenon. Um, so um, the this is a child um, and as you guys recall from your embryology, the brain, um, when the brain develops, you have no uh, convolutions and as the brain grows, you develop convolutions and that increases the surface area of the brain. So um, the, in, in kids with lysencephaly, there are no convolutions, so you have a completely smooth brain um, and, um, and um, what this leads to is developmental delay and seizures because of the lack of surface area. You've got much less cortical uh, and, and abnormal cortex. Um, there are multiple congenital uh, abnorm chromosomal abnormalities that are associated with this, but the one that's really important, and, and I've left these for you, you don't have to memorize all these. What I want you to just remember is the one syndrome that um, has a likelihood of appearing on your examination, that's miller deeker Okay, it's chromosome 17p13.3. Um, sometimes examiners like to pick on things that are the common chromosomal abnormalities. Um, and there are some associated findings, antiverted no nostrils, prominent upper lip, um, micronathia, but lysencephaly is the, um, is the uh, clearly associated finding. Um, and again, these kids have um, significant developmental delay and seizures and difficult to control seizures. So it's miller deeker um, schizencephaly is another thing that, um, that we see um, relatively commonly within neurology and it's, it's um, if you look right here, you see, you, you guys see this? This is a brain, not an eye, right? <laughs> um, and this is a cleft 
And if you look around the edges, um, this is a fascinating phenomenon because if you look around the edges, you see that you actually have gray matter around the edges. And so it's a developmental abnormality and it is a cleft um, in the cerebral hemisphere. You can have unilateral or bilateral. And if you think about it, it may be associated with an early vascular insult or development, uh, a failure of development within the vasculature because this follows a pattern. And frequently when you look at these, you'll see that they follow a pattern almost um, um, uh, tracing the territory of the middle cerebral artery. But um, just remember that you can have unilateral, bilateral clefts with schizencephaly. The one that you're going to see much more frequently than um, the other two previous defects are poor encephalic cysts. And if you look right here, the two types of cysts that are talked about a lot within pediatrics are arachnoid cysts and poor encephalic cysts. Remember that poor encephalic cysts are associated with um, expansion of the um, ventricular system. Um, or sometimes you'll see it in the subarachnoid space as well, but really for your purposes, it's, it's this enlargement of the ventricle often associated with um, one of the things that you see most commonly within pediatrics, and that's um, early babies, right? So the other associated MRI finding or descriptor is periventricular leukomalacia, okay? And that's associated with um, poor encephalic cysts. Um, Holoprosencephaly is another anomaly that is um, commonly quizzed upon. And remember, it's a defect in the development of the prosencephalon. When the brain and the thalamus, uh, or these areas around the thalamus and the hypothalamus are being separated, um, there is a problem in, in the defect. And often you, get, you can get um, uh, extremes, a low bar, semi low bar, and low bar. Are, um, low bar is the, the, what we have here. Um, where you actually have failure of division in, in the midline. And the thing that you want to remember about the, the spectrum of holoprosencephaly is that this is a midline problem with the head, with the brain, and you can get external um, manifestations of that, and that is cyclopia and premaxillary agenesis, okay? And so you may get a picture of someone with cyclopia, and the, the question might be, what is the associate, what might you see in the brain, okay? Um, trisomy in 13 and 18 are associated with this. Again, important things for pediatricians to know. Okay. Um, we're almost through the uh, congenital abnormalities. Agenesis of the corpus callosum is something you'll see a lot. Um, uh, and um, sometimes it means a lot. Sometimes it has less significance. The times that would... When, when it's important for you on your examination is to think about the, the pathology that may be associated with it. Um, ACARD syndrome is the one neurologic um, syndrome that um, can cause, or one of the neurologic syndromes uh, that's associated with, uh, with a genesis of the corpus callosum that can be associated with significant problems. So a child presents, your scenario may be, a child presents with infantile spasms, and maybe, um, is, uh, maybe your exam will even say has chorial retinal lacunes. What might be the other associated finding? The, the triad is agenesis of the corpus callosum plus chorial retinal lacunes and infantile spasms. Okay, and remember, acardi occurs only in girls. It is X-linked dominant. Okay, so the scenario will be a little girl that presents with this. Um, uh, it can, uh, um, in terms of corp uh, agenesis of the corpus callosum, it can be associated with uh, maternal cocaine use. There are other multiple genetic lo lo loci that have been delineated, but just remember ACARD, okay, for your purposes. CP, something that you guys see all the time, will see all the time in practice. Um, what is the definition? What's the frequency? Um, uh, it's static motor deficit. Remember that it's CP is really defined as a motor problem and, and not, um, not necessarily a, um, a cognitive problem, although mental retardation is seen in about half of kids. 
Seizures, although you might think are seen in all kids, is actually uh, actually will occur in less than half ki- half of the kids with CP. And the frequency of CP is actually quite high, one to two per 1,000. So um, there may be questions about care with uh, with regards to CP, but most of the the kinds of questions that you might encounter are more likely to be etiology questions. Um, I'll just remind you that there are multiple types of, of CP um, depending on the type of um, insult um, at birth. And uh, the most common that you'll see are the one, the kids that you see coming in with seizures and um, in the emergency room all the time are the ones with uh, either spastic quadriparesis or spastic um, um, uh, paraparesis. Um, <clears throat> and that constitutes 70% of kids. Athetotic CP is less common. Um, remember that the athetosis that occurs with these kids um, is uh, likely secondary to an insult to the basal ganglia. So um, the, the, these are kids who have had um, a hypoxic insult at birth and have um, bilateral basal ganglia involvement. Okay, etiology. Um, um, this is, uh, these kinds of questions appear all the time on examinations. Remember that um, although there's a lot of talk about birth injury as being an etiology of CP, the most common reason for cerebral palsy is low birth weight and prematurity, okay? It constitutes, and if you look at this, it's greater than, it's probably about 40% of cases. Um, um, other significant etiologies you'll see here, and if you look right here, um, the uh, issue of asphyxia as um, being the etiology of CP um, uh, constitutes probably less than 10%. Okay, so low birth weight and prematurity is the answer if you're looking for what the most common etiology of CP is. <clears throat> Moving on to stroke. Okay, stroke is. Um, relatively uncommon compared to the things that we have talked about. Um, but something that's important that examiners will um, may focus on only because you don't want to miss a stroke, okay? Half of stroke in pediatrics, um, uh, half are ischemic, the other half are hemorrhagic, and a good number occur in the neonatal period, okay? Um, in terms of the ischemic infarcts that you see, 75% um, are arterial and 25% are, are in the venous um, system. The, um, the thing that you want to um, think about in terms of questions is um, you may get a scenario with the child that presents at six months of age with early hand dominance. Uh, remember to think about a CNF etiology and that there may have been a perinatal infarct that explain that. So you may get a scenario with a child um, that presents um, with um, with gross motor delay and hand dominance um, early on. Um, the answer will be to look to see if there has been an early infarct or there's a structural abnormality um, leading to that dominance. In terms of acute stroke in childhood, unlike the um, in the adult population, uh, one of the most common presenting um, symptoms is seizures, okay? So if you get a scenario with a child that presents with a seizure, and then weakness on the one hand, on the one side, um, you're uh, and you're given the choice of consider stroke or Todd's paresis. Todd's paresis is a diagnosis of exclusion, so don't choose Todd's paresis until you're absolutely sure that there's no focal ischemic injury. Okay, um, and um, um, whether or not your examiners expect you to have a a, a more detailed um, more detailed knowledge about um, stroke and imaging. If the question comes up as to what imaging modality you want, of course you want an MRI, and then you will want to do a DWI. If you look at this picture right here, this is a DWI, um, which is a diffusion weighted image, um, which is a, a specific and special image that um, is uh, will show you whether there's been a stroke, okay? Um, etiologies, um, the questions may focus on the kinds of 
uh, of uh, the kind of workup that you want to do. Remember that cardiac, you never want to forget about uh, a cardiac etiology, and you don't want to forget about potential vascular, et vascular etiologies as well. So always get vascular imaging. Um, I haven't listed it here, um, but don't forget about dissection as a possible etiology and other vascular causes. Um, the, um, the classical metabolic question that you're going to um, want to think uh, answer, they may say, you know, what other metabolic causes might, um, might be associated with this. Remember, Febreze and homocystinuria are associated with um, stroke. Okay. Important um, to remember, um, especially for those who um, deal with the African-American population is sickle cell disease um, is very frequently associated with stroke. And a quarter of kids um, uh, have at least a silent infarct by the time they're teenagers. Um, so, and the important thing about this is that there is a specific treatment recommendation um, for which there's evidence. Remember that, there, that you can do chronic transfusions for sickle cell anemia. So you may get a question about transfusions. Okay, um, this picture is to remind you of Moya Moya. If they show you a picture of anything vascular, it's, it's um, potentially a Moya Moya. And if you look at this, this is, um, this is uh, the word Moya Moya means puff of smoke. And what you see here is an abrupt cutoff here um, at the um, supraclinoid portion of the internal carotid artery. And then um, uh, significant revascularization and collateralization. Um, remember that Moya Moya can be associated with sickle cell disease and that you always want to look at the vessels in sickle cell. And the second thing to remember about Moya Moya is that there's an intervention, um, a, a bypass um, surgery. So you uh, want to ask your neurosurgical colleagues um, about um, intervention for Moya Moya. But those are the things to remember about Moya Moya. Okay, association with sickle cell, sometimes with neurofibromatosis, um, and also that there that you can intervene. Okay. Okay, trauma. Something that's really, really exciting in the press. So there's, um, I don't know if the uh, the more recent attention in the press to concussion and head injury is going to result in more questions on trauma, but it certainly has resulted in, or it has been a part of. Um, the grow, growth in understanding and thinking about head trauma. What's wrong with this boy? He's not wearing a helmet. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think he's playing hockey. Maybe it's street hockey. So I, I wouldn't expect him to wear a helmet. Um, but he's not wearing a helmet. And he got bonked in the head with something. Um, Okay, so sport-related concussion. This is something that um, there's been a lot of debate of, uh, over uh, in uh, the last few years. How many of you uh, follow hockey? One, two, <laughs> a couple in the audience. Okay. How many of you know who Sidney Crosby is? Three people? <laughs> You're obviously not Canadians because <laughs> Sidney Crosby is a, is a national icon. Um, so... Um, Sport-related concussion and injury within sport has, um, has become more, of more and more interest. Sidney Crosby is a hockey player who is um, probably the, uh, the, the best-known hockey player with, you know, sort of shining talent who got banged on the head several times last year and was out for the season. Um, the important thing about it is it, it led to a, a lot closer attention um, within um, uh, uh, within sports teams um, about bringing kids back to play, and it, it um, and it led to more attention to the uh, to the guidelines for return to sport. The American Academy of Neurology um, has um, uh, undergone revisions in its uh, definitions of sport-related concussion. I'm going to give you some guidelines um, that have um, been published within pediatrics. Um, and remember, whenever you're thinking about concussion, it's, uh, uh, you take a conservative, sensible approach when you're looking at those questions when they're you know, asking. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you the table in, in just a minute. But remember that concussion is something that you may not see any um, sign of on an MRI scan. Um, and I'm certain um, that over if, if you guys are doing any general pediatrics or emergency room or anything like that, you'll see more and more families coming to you asking you questions of concussion about concussion. Questions. 
Okay, the features. I've listed features. The important things to pay attention to uh, are that there has been some sort of mechanism of, of injury of the head. There's been either a direct blow or uh, some sort of a bang on the head, and, and that there is short-lived neurologic impairment. It does not matter if there's a loss of consciousness or not, okay? There, um, and that you may not see abnormalities on standard structural neuroimaging studies, okay? That's very important. You may see some petechial hemorrhages. You may see some evidence of what, you, what the neuroradiologist reports as a, a diffuse axonal injury, but that is not necessary for the diagnosis, the clinical diagnosis. Okay, when do you send kids back to sport? It's extremely confusing. Uh, and again, go back to the, uh, the basic principle is to, of being conservative and that um, kids really need complete physical and cognitive rest. Um, here I've given you a slide that shows you um, a, a six-stage return to play. What that means is that every... The way to remember it is that if there are six stages, the six is returning to play. Every single day in here, or every single stage, constitutes a day at a minimum. And so the minimum return to sports after a concussion is five days. You have to go through every single one of the stages. And remember, too, that, um, that the children have to be asymptomatic. If during any of these stages they get symptoms again, they're back at that stage. They're back to the stage before, okay? So minimum of five days. That's what you need to remember for your examination and to, for counseling families, okay? Um, skull fractures are extremely common. Um, they are um, common in boys more than girls, and we know that. Uh, we know that... Um, Trauma is more common in boys than girls. This is a picture of a, uh, a skull fracture. And what's special about this skull fracture? It's depressed, right. And so you guys know the key um, to identifying what's important in a skull fracture is, is it depressed or is it not? Most skull fractures are linear. A small percentage will be depressed, but those are the ones that you really want to worry about. And um, uh, remember that um, there are different places in the skull, the, the bones of the skull are different in different places. Remember about mechanism of injury and the different um, thickness, the uh, different thicknesses of the bone. And remember that the temporal bone is extremely thin. So if you see a child that has um, been hit or around the, temp the, the temporal window, around the Temporal bones, think carefully about whether you're going to look for a, uh, a skull fracture there and treat it differently than if, you, um, if someone gets a frontal bang, okay? Um, uh, here I've um, written down some uh, criteria for getting neuroimaging. Um, on the next slide, I'm going um, to give you some um, criteria that have been um, uh, evaluated for sensitivity for finding a uh, finding a significant um, problem. Okay, but these are very sensible common sense. If there's an um, altered mental status, loss of consciousness, seizures, focal neurologic signs, or a little tiny baby. Okay, because the uh, very tiny babies who have um, had, for example, a fall off of a even a dressing uh, like a, a a changing table um, can have a parietal skull fracture because they have um, their uh, bones are much softer. Okay, these are the this is the table that I was talking to you about. And again, remember, examiners are looking for uh, for whether you. Um, will do the right thing in, emergen in an emergency situation. So what are you looking for? When are you going to see that, um, when is the CT going to pay off uh, for minor head trauma? There was a study that was published in 2010 trying to uh, elicit new criteria for uh, evaluation of minor head trauma where, where, you, where you can get most bang for your buck um, because of increased sensitivity to use of CT because what, what have we found when we started um, using so many CTs? What the result of that? Tumors, right? The, so there have been lots and lots of reports. Or there have been more reports of, um, of complications related to uh, the development of um, oncological problems. So um, 
This categorizes things into high risk and medium risk. And these are things that you might want to remember uh, for your examination because the examination won't ask you questions like um, what's high risk and what's medium risk. It will ask you, it will give you a scenario with a child with a boggy hematoma of the scalp. Well, that's very, that, that's relatively high risk. It's medium risk, but the sensitivity for seeing a brain injury on CT is 98%. Remember this list of things not reaching a GCS of 15 after two hours. If you think there's an open skull fracture, so an open wound with, um, with a mechanism of injury that might suggest a skull fracture, worsening headache and irritability. Common sense, right? If you see signs of a basal skull fracture, and I'll remind you on the next slide what a basal skull fracture looks like, or if there's a dangerous mechanism of injury no matter what. So if a baseball bat, if a child has been hit with a baseball bat um, by his brother, by accident or on purpose or whatever, you really want to think about getting an image because the likelihood, especially if there's a hematoma that you can identify, because the likelihood you're going to find something is high. Okay. Um, remember about basilar skull fractures, and this may be something where you, on, on the examination, where you're given a uh, particular scenario, and um, a mother brings a child in with um, with black eyes on both sides, and you need to identify what the the um, what to do. You always remember to look for otorrhea and rhinorrhea because that's a CSF leak. Okay. Um, and you want to observe that child in hospital because the, the risk is infection, okay? This is something that you may want to refer as well to your neurosurgical colleagues. Okay, more trauma. So um, when do you see subdural hemorrhage? Babies. And what are you going to worry about if you see a subdural hemorrhage in a baby? Right, non-accidental trauma. So the scenario you may get on an examination is that a child comes in an irritable, a child comes in who's irritable, and on imaging you might see this. And and what what do you see here? What's that? Blood. And what's is this lentiform? Not really. It sort of goes along the convexity of the brain, right? It's it's more flat. You may get a story about a, an acute, a picture with an acute bleed where the blood is white, right? Or you might get a picture with one here and the one that's isointense with the, um, with the brain parenchyma. So if you get a scenario like that, it may even just be described that you get a, a report on a baby with a new hemorrhage and a subdural hemorrhage that is iso intense with the brain parenchyma. The number one question that you want to ask is what's going on in the house, right? What's okay, so this is one where you're gonna suspect non accidental trauma and where are you where else what else are you gonna do? Gonna do a skeletal survey and then what else, are you gonna where else? You look in the eyes for Retinal hemorrhages, okay? So very important. Pay attention if, if it's a, a little baby with a subdural hemorrhage. Think carefully about, um, uh, about non-accidental trauma. Of course, it can be associated with bacterial meningitis as well. Here you see there's significant midline shift in this with um, cerebral edema. Um, and so uh, this could have been a very severe non-accidental trauma. Um, uh, this, again, is something that you want your neurosurgical colleagues involved with. Um, they may or not may or not um, intervene at the moment um, because the bleed is generally thought to be slower than in um, an arterial bleed, and the recovery is good. But remember, it's not the recovery that's going to be asked about on your examination. It's going to be the associated problems that you might pick up. Okay, let's move on to another scenario. Child gets hit with a um, with a uh, uh, a hockey puck, again, back to Canadian analogies because we're going to try to make this as international as possible. A baseball. So I get hit with a baseball in the head and does fine. Um, but then six hours later, starts vomiting and complaining of headache. Now, given that scenario, what do you want to do? 
you want to do a scan, okay? What do you see here? Okay, it's a it's an, a lentiform abnormality. Remember, this looks like a lens, okay? Um, and the a couple of important things. Remember that these um, these fractures um, that are associated with epidural hematomas are often in the temporal bone. Remember what I said about the temporal bone being very thin. But what also sits in the temporal bone? The middle meningeal artery. Okay, so it's an arterial tear. And the question that you might get, if you're going to get an anatomical question, is what artery would be associated with this? That's a middle meningeal artery. And it's a lens-shaped opacity. And this is a neurosurgical emergency. And so this is another one where um, you can get, if you have several, um, uh, if it's a graded question, um, and you don't get the neurosurgical consult, you could miss the whole question. Do not forget to do the, the key thing, which is to get an uh, emergency neurosurgical consult, okay? And also remember about the lucid interval. That's a classical story, um, but you certainly can see epidural hemorrhages which occur um, without the lucid interval, okay? Think carefully about the mechanism and the localization of the injury. Okay, and that's it about trauma. Um, you, the likelihood is that you'll probably get some questions on trauma because, um, uh, because emergencies are so important. It, again, the, the examiners are looking to um, find out if you're safe. Um, and so, you know, go over those, some of those, emerg those emergency scenarios carefully. Peripheral nerve injuries. Do we see peripheral nerve injuries in pediatrics? <laughs> yes. Okay, which one do we see? This is the only one, it's not the only one we see, but the most common one that we see. Brachial plexus injuries. Um, there's a possibility you will get questions on brachial plexus injuries because they are so common. Remember that the time when we see them is at birth and that, uh, that the injury is associated with the mode of um, delivery. So if the baby is big, macrosomia, if there have been forceps, if there's shoulder dystocia, um, then think about a brachial plexus injury and remember to look at the baby and check the baby for a clavicular fracture, okay? Um, what kinds of brachial plexus injuries are there? This is just to demonstrate how superficial the brachial plexus is and that you can have upper, trunk, uh, upper and lower plexus injuries, um, but the most common that we have is the upper plexus injury, okay? It's um, if you look at this baby's arm, this is what you're going to see in the neonatal nursery all the time. You've got the waiter's tip, and that is because it is uh, due to the, um, the upper plexus. The arm is internally rot rotated. The deltoid doesn't work, so there's no shoulder abduction. Pronated wrist and absent reflexes, okay? Um, the key here is recognizing um, that the majority will recover by three months, but not everyone, okay? 90% will recover by three months. And so the window that you want to look at when uh, for an examination question is, when are you going to refer on to uh, a neurosurgical or a plastic surgery colleague for evaluation of the brachial plexus? And that's after three months. Um, if, if you have a particularly severe brachial plexus injury, um, also remember that you can do an MRI scan of the brachial plexus, which um, evaluates, can evaluate whether you have avulsion of the plexus, which leads to a poorer prognosis. And so there may be a question asking about what other modalities you can use to evaluate the plexus injury. Not every baby needs an MRI, but if it's not better um, by about three months, you can look at the brachial plexus and ask one of your colleagues. And, and remember, too, that, um, uh, that neurosurgeons that um, do corrective brachial plexus surgery are few and far between, so you may have to look hard. Okay, this is the lower plexus injury, much less comma CAT1. So what that means is that the intrinsic hand muscles are more likely to be involved and that you might see a Horner syndrome. The one sort of uh, examiners like to ask about syndromal kinds of things. So you may find a baby that's got uh, you know, on your examination with intrinsic hand muscle problems that, you know, that's born and um, may um, have meiosis and hydrosis and ptosis as well. Uh, remember that would be a lower plexus injury. Much less common though, okay? Okay, so everyone ready for neurocutaneous disorders? Okay, let's move on. Okay, tuberous sclerosis. Tuberous sclerosis is um, not very common, 
but examiners love to ask questions about it. Why do they like to ask questions? Because there are concrete features and because you don't want to miss the diagnosis because um, you may have some problems, there, li a lifetime of problems down the line. So the scenario you'll get on your examination will not be a CT scan or an MRI scan, but it'll be a child that presents with a picture like this with adenoma sebation. And the parent may bring the child in um, on your scenario um, uh, as so it may be a six-year-old child that comes in and uh, with developmental delay, and he or she is noted to have, the parent says that um, he or she looks like um, she's got acne, okay? Um, so, and then the question might be, what is the mode of inheritance of this disorder? The, the examiner is going to assume that you're going to um, come to the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis. Remember that it's autosomal dominant, but 50 to 70 percent are new mutations, and that the chromosomes, uh, of the chromosomes that you want to remember, these are ones, um, and then chromosome 9 and 16 for TSC1 and 2, okay? Um, I'm going to show you some pictures of things that you might see with tuberous sclerosis because those are all fair game for your examination. Um, go over the criteria um, afterwards and remember that you need a major and two minor criteria to make the diagnosis and these criteria uh, involve um, uh, the appearance of things like subungual fib uh, sorry, uh, ungual fibromas, subependomal hematomas, and retinal hematomas, as well as um, uh, cardiac and renal involvement. And, you know, something that you might see on an examination in association with tuberous sclerosis is, um, is a question about systemic effects. So always remember to look at the kidneys. Always remember to look at the heart. Okay? I'll show you some pictures now. This is an ungual fi fibroma right here. Okay? And again, you know, you get that picture and you think of tuberous sclerosis. This is a tuber, okay? Um, this is a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma. Why is this important? Because it's associated with tuberous sclerosis, but it can also um, uh, be catastrophic. So if you don't watch these, um, they, can, um, they can actually cause an obstructive hydrocephalus and cause significant problems. So as you can see here, this is a large, um, uh, large mass uh, that's been removed by surgery. Okay. Retinal astrocytic hamartoma, this is what one looks like, okay, if you get a picture of that on your examination. Um, Okay, and that's tuberous sclerosis. Those are probably the most common things you'll see. And remember about the, uh, about the hypopigmented macules that you'll see with tuberous sclerosis. Um, a scenario you might see with tuberous sclerosis is a baby presents with infantile spasms. And on examination, they may show you a picture of a hypopigmented macule because sometimes that's the only thing you'll see in a tuberous sclerosis baby. Okay, so just think, okay. What do I need to do? I need to look at the heart, I need to look at the kidneys, and I need to look at the head if I see that. Okay, NF1. This we see much more commonly. Um, and again, this is another one that examiners love to ask questions about, mode of inheritance and the chromosome. Autosomal dominant, chromosome 17. 50% um, are sporadic, just like in tuberous sclerosis. Um, and you will not get questions on what the most important um, way of, uh, of finding the, um, the chromosomal abnormality is. Just keep in mind the, the defect is in chromosome 17, okay? Um, so what are the diagnostic criteria? Everyone here has probably seen multiple cases of neurofibromatosis. I've put the diagnostic criteria up here for you. And the important thing to note here um, that you, you need to remember about neurocutaneous disorders is that as you go through life, things increase. So for the cafe au lait spot, before puberty and after puberty, the rules are different. The um, 0 0.5 centimeters or larger um, is sufficient for prepubertal um, kids, um, whereas the spots have to be 1.5 centimeters or larger, and you need six or more, okay? So they grow with age. The other thing to note, and I'll show you some pictures of these, is that the LISH nodules that are associated with NF1, um, I, I doubt if your examiners are going to give you a trick question, but you won't see those in a baby that you're trying to make a diagnosis of uh, neurofibromatosis. Those come, don't come out until kids are about five or six years of age. Um, and um, the optic gl gliomas, too, you should be able to pick up relatively, these you should be able to pick up relatively early. Okay. 
So these are the diagnostic criteria, but remember they increase with age. And here's a picture just reminding you of where you might see abnormalities. Okay, this, just look at the picture, but remember the, the most important thing within the diagnostic criteria is the fact that the caffeolae spots are, grow bigger through time um, and that you're not going to see Lish nodules um, in the younger kids. Okay, this is a flexiform neurofibroma, just showing you some pictures. These are neurofibromas. They're not always clustered like this. Sometimes you might see them in, on a physical exam. You might just see one or two of them, and sometimes they have a bluish kind of appearance. But if you get something on an examination, um, I would think that the, the uh, examiners are going to put something on that is not subtle, and something like this is fair game. Okay, this is axillary freckling. Definitely not inguinal. This is the axilla. Um, remember that we do not, these are not sun exposed areas. So if you examine a child and see axillary freckling, just it, this is more than you often see with the kids with NF1. If you just see a few spots under the arm, really think about neurofibromatosis, okay? Because the, um, freckles usually appear in sun exposed areas, okay? And this is a picture of an optic glioma, just to remind you that this is a frequent association with NF1. Um, this is uh, bony abnormalities. Remember to, to watch out for bones. Okay, and these are the Lish nodules. See, they look like little tiny neurofibromas. Um, in the iris, this is a, a picture from a slit lamp examination. Um, and there, uh, again, uh, remember that this only appears after a child is five or six years of age. When you get a question on neurofibromatosis, you may want to, the, there may be questions, as, you know, who else needs to be involved? Always involve an ophthalmologist. A neurologist uh, should, um, can frequently be involved as well, but ophthalmology is a very important um, group to get involved. Okay, moving on from NF1 to Sturge-Weber. Now, this is the trick question that comes on almost every examination. It'll say something like, what is the mode of inheritance of Sturge-Weber? And your inclination is because everything is autosomal dominant um, to do that. This is the one that's sporadic, okay? It's a chance thing. The, occurrence, the uh, incidence is much lower than NF1 or tuberous sclerosis. It's one in 50,000. But it's one that examiners like to put lots of questions about because it's so distinctive and you don't want to miss it. So remember that the port, there's a port wine stain associated with it, and I've got a picture of it, and the distribution is V1 and V2 of the trigeminal nerve. Um, because of the, this is the serpentiginous uh, pattern that you can see. Um, with Sturge Weber, this is a late manifestation. You may not see this in infancy in a child with a, a port wine stain, um, but it's the kind of thing that's classical and may appear on examinations. Okay, and this is due to calcifications. Um, and the other very important thing not to forget about for examinations, you get a child with a port wine stain. What is another... Um, outside of seizures, developmental delay, what other system is going to be involved? And don't forget about glaucoma and get the, um, get the eyes examined and the pressures examined, okay? This is a picture of a child with, a, a, with Sturge Weber and a port wine stain, okay? Okay, so that's neurocutaneous disorders, the big, three big ones that, um, that, you'll, um, that appear over and over on examinations to our tuberous sclerosis, NF1, and Sturge Weber. So um, those are sort of some quick facts about them. Okay, seizures. Now, we're down to what we see lots and lots of in child neurology. What I'm going to um, talk to you about here is um, different medications that are used, side effects, uh, catastrophic side effects, um, and different seizure syndromes that may appear on your examination. Okay, remember that seizures occur very frequently in the pediatric population. Um, in the first year of life, one in a thousand. In ages one to five, um, six in a thousand. So the littler you are, the more likely, uh, uh, when you're one to five, it's, it's extremely common to have seizures. Epilepsy, as you know, is defined as recurrent seizures. It may occur in 1% of the population. And the um, 
and we all know that the um, that we shouldn't treat a, after the first seizure, treat after the second seizure because the likelihood of recurrence is greater than 50% after a child's had a second seizure. Okay, generalized seizures. Um, remember that we divide seizures into where they come from, and so the category of generalized seizures means that both hemispheres are involved, and there's a category of idiopathic generalized epilepsy, um, which represents many of the kids that you'll take care of that, are, um, that have um, seizures that are developmentally normal. 60% of childhood seizures are generalized, so there's, and remember that there's no aura associated um, and a loss of consciousness associated. Um, the motor activity is bilateral. These are all things that are um, very apparent to you, I'm sure, and that the EEG shows bilateral activity, and that's why we call them generalized. By con um, one category of generalized seizures that is very important um, because it is a red flag to potential metabolic problems is that of myoclonic seizures. Okay, they're short and they are rapid, bilateral. They almost look like a moro sometimes. Um, symmetric muscle contractions, or it could be isolated muscle groups. Why are they important? Again, because they may be a sign of a progressive metabolic disorder. Um, for generalized seizures and myoclonic seizures, broad spectrum anticonvulsants um, are effective, and valproic acid works very well. So, important thing about myoclonic seizures is that. Um, you may get a question about, well, you know, uh, you may get a list of medications which, um, which you might use with a child. You may get a scenario with a child that's got some myoclonic seizures. And remember that myoclonic seizures can be worsened by phenytoin, carbamazepine, or lamotrigine. So do not choose those medications when um, dealing with a child with myoclonic seizures. Okay. Uh, one of the um, common... Um, idiopathic generalized epilepsy is juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, or JME. Um, this is this is fair game for your examination, um, uh, only because it's um, it's a relatively benign seizure syndrome and very common. Um, it comes on at 8 to 20 years. The EEG you won't need to know about, but just to, it has a very specific EEG hallmark, which is um, 4 to 6 uh, hertz polyspike wave. And if you see right here, you look right here, this is, these are generalized discharges on an EEG, okay? Remember that these are the kids that have myoclonus in the morning, and so the question that you might get is, um, Johnny um, drops his toothbrush in the morning um, when, he, uh, when he's brushing his teeth or has been dropping um, breakfast dishes or um, tends to fling his pencil across the room in his morning classes. Okay, so th that might be the clini clinical scenario you're given. These are kids who have seizures upon awakening generalized seizures upon awakening, and as I said earlier, the IQ is normal. Um, the question that may, uh, you may get is, what is the treatment of choice? Valproic acid is the treatment of choice in these kids, okay? So JME goes with valproic acid, normal IQ, and generalized discharges with 4 to 6 hertz. Um, this is the, this is, this comes on every examination, absence epilepsy. And you guys have seen lots and lots of absence epilepsy. Um, the scenario, the clinical scenario with absence epilepsy that you might get on an examination is that of a child that's, that's not paying attention at school, um, that the parents um, feel is not listening, and that's been a recent onset, and the child is about five or six years of age. Um, what the clinical manifestations, as you know, are is are the staring uh, staring episodes, eye rolling, and eyelid flickering. So, what's important to know about these kids? Development is normal, and the pattern. If you need to know one EEG pattern, it's this one, and that's three hertz generalized spike and wave. I've given you a picture here of what it looks like. This is a generalized. These are generalized discharges with three hertz. One, two, three per line right here, um, spike wave, okay? The other thing that you can do in clinic is to hyperventilate these kids, to bring them on, to make your diagnosis. So there may be a diagnostic question. 
Um, and remember that these are younger kids and they outgrow them. Okay, so by the time um, they're in puberty, the seizures should be gone. What is the treatment of choice? Okay, um, ethosuximide is the treatment of choice in these kids. If they fail ethosuximide, valproic acid or any generalized, any general um, uh, anticonvulsant um, would be good. But for examination purposes, if you have a child that's got eyelid flickering and staring episodes and a report comes back that the EEG shows three hertz spike and wave, give ethosuximide as your first line. Okay. Okay, so those are the, the generalized epilepsies that you'll most likely see on your examination, JME and absence epilepsy. What's next? Partial seizures. These are the, um, the more difficult to control seizures. Um, they constitute about half of childhood seizures. And the important thing there is you, if you get a scenario with a child with a focal seizure um, who uh, um, has a new onset focal seizure, remember to do an MRI to rule out a focal lesion because the, um, in real life and in your examination, um, you want to be thinking, well, what bad thing can I rule out? And what do you want to make sure is not there? A tumor, a mass, some space occupying lesion, okay? Um, you may have complex partial and simple partial seizures. Um, just remember that you will not be asked questions on you know, differentiating between simple and partial, um, complex partial seizures. Just remember that you can have a seizure where consciousness is retained, okay? Um, complex partial seizures, if you get anything about localization, it will be uh, with a seizure, it'll be a temporal lobe seizure um, in which automatisms are associated with sometimes an epigastric rising sensation. Um, remember that um, complex partial seizures, in contrast to absence seizures, may be associated with staring, but there's postictal confusing, whereas with absence, the kids are out for a few seconds, and then they're back to normal, and no one realizes that there's anything wrong, and they don't get tired. With complex partial seizures, the kids get tired, okay? These are the ones that are difficult to control. Seizure control is found in only a third of kids, and these are ones that you may want to think early about um, surgical intervention. Temporal lobe epilepsy, as, as I mentioned earlier, is, um, is an extremely common localization. And the one thing that you want to, if you have a child that has a, a temporal lobe focus, if you're uh, um, asked a question about what might be an associated finding, mesial temporal sclerosis, you see right here, um, is um, is a common finding. And um, what's important about this is that this may make the child a good surgical candidate, candidate if there is, um, if you have intractable seizures, okay? You guys see that? The difference from side to side of the temporal lobe? It's a little bright here. See how juicy this one looks? <laughs> and see the side right here where you have a little bit, it's, it's, it's a little bit of scarring, okay? So it's mesial temporal sclerosis. Okay. What are you guys going to see most of? The, the kids with um, uh, intractable seizures most likely are, are, um, are going to need to be cared for by you know, someone with, uh, with experience in taking care of seizures. Um, benign Orlandic epilepsy, um, just like the um, absence and JME, is a good outcome syndrome. What do you want to know about these? I'll, I'll show you an EEG in a minute of this. Um, that it's associated with central temporal sharp waves and they come from all over the place. They come from the left and the right um, and that kids are young. The common scenario that you'll see is that you have a nocturnal seizure with facial twitching, drooling, and a focal seizure. And importantly, for a benign Rolandic epilepsy, because many of the seizures are nocturnal, and sometimes children will only have one seizure, you may not choose to give anticonvulsants. Okay, so you may get a trick question of what's the treatment of choice, and um, you can always opt not to treat. If you choose treatment, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine are good choices, anything that's good for focal seizures. 
Remember that these kids have normal development and like the kids with absence, they have a very good outcome and they grow out of their seizures by the time they're teenagers. Okay, and here's a classical picture just to let you, just to show you that you can have very frequent abnormalities on EEG. These kids do fine, they grow out of their, their seizures. There may be a counseling question related to that. Okay, <clears throat> infantile spasms. Um, now, this is not something that kids grow out of. Um, what will you need to know for uh, about infantile sp spasms? Remember that because, uh, just remember from the name, infantile spasms, they most occur at less than one year, but on the outside window, it may, they may occur up to 18 months. Um, if you go back to some of the things we talked about, what are the associations um, with infantile spasms? Tuberous sclerosis, ACARD, so always think what is the underlying diagnosis? Because an infantile spasm, when you have a child with infantile spasms, um, the likelihood is you're going to find an underlying pathologic diagnosis. Most, the most common reason for infantile spasms is hypoxic, um, previous hypoxic uh, ischemic or hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy encephalopathy, so a previous um, perinatal and neonatal kind of insult. But you always want to think about um, chromosomal and metabolic etiologies in these kids because these are significant and serious seizures. The types um, that you will see um, and the scenario that you might be presented with would be uh, something, and, and examiners are not going to try to trick you. Um, they'll describe a cluster of movements that the parents might describe as something like a moro, but would be a, either a flexor or an extensor spasm. Um, what are the EEG findings associated with it? Um, you will not likely have to remember details about the EEG findings, but remember that the EEG is very abnormal with Hypsarrhythmia, those of you that have spent some time um, in, uh, with neurology or have, um, have evaluated EEGs or have had taken care of kids with infantile spasms will remember that hypsarrhythmia is the hallmark of it, and it really is a sign of um, chaotic brain activity. Um, the associated thing that you may see on an examination is the fact that there are electro decrements associated with each of the spasms. Okay, so that's something to pay attention to. What is the treatment of choice? There is a new guideline coming out in the next few months from the American Academy of Neurology, um, which basically restates what the previous guideline was. But um, remember that the treatment of choice, according to evidence, um, according to evidence, is um, ACTH, oral steroids are something that um, are um, now talked about more and more frequently um, and are used, um, and that vigabatrin, if you have a child with tuberous sclerosis who has infantile spasms, vigabatrin is the treatment of choice. And you see that the, that the FDA brought vigabatrin back to the United States in 2009, and so it is the first treatment if there's tuberous sclerosis, okay? Um, this, is a, this is a decrement right here. You see the flattening? Okay, so just keep that picture in mind and remember that it, when you have a spasm, it flattens out. Um, will you get questions about syndromes, uh, epilepsy syndromes? Um, if you get anything, it'll be um, on Lennox Gastaut, um, where there is a triad of different kinds of seizures. These are the kids that have had infantile, frequently have had infantile spasms in the past and have developed intractable, intractable seizures. What's key about them? They have three different kinds of seizures. Atypical absence, so they have staring episodes, atonic seizures, so loss of tone of the body, and generalized tonic-clonic seizures. Um, a, uh, association with mental retardation. And then they have a very typical EEG, which, whereas if you remember the normal children with absence epilepsy had sp spike and wave, that was three hertz, these have one to two hertz slow spike and wave. So these kids are a little bit different from the kids with absence epilepsy, okay? <clears throat> 
And this is a picture of slow slicing wave, okay? Which is to be contrasted with the previous picture we had of kids with absence. Okay, what are some other syndromes that, that may come up? Um, Lando Kleffner, um, although extremely uncommon, people love to ask questions about it because it's, a, it's an acquired aphasia type of syndrome. So if you have a child that comes in that has, um, a, has had some focal seizures and has um, a, a, an acquired aphasia, remember um, for Lando Kleffner that you want to admit the child to a long-term um, EEG monitoring unit to get slow wave sleep. Okay. And Rasmussen is something that, um, although extremely common, is something that, um, that you will need to um, know about only because it, is a, um, it has a severe outcome. So um, it's uh, kids with focal seizures, something called epilepsia partialis continua, which is just um, seizures which are, are unremitting, partial seizures which are unremitting. Um, and the etiology is thought to be um, autoimmune. If you can see, you have progressive hemispheric um, dysfunction, progressive um, abnormality of the, hem of the hemisphere, and it's unilateral. Um, you won't need to really um, deal with treatments, but just recognize, and recognize the name Rasmussen, and that is a, a hemispheric dysfunction. Okay? Okay. So those are the seizure syndromes which are most likely to appear on your examinations. Um, now on to um, medications. What examiners love to ask questions about is um, not only what you use first line for different, um, different things, but what bad things. They, they want to know if you um, know what bad things can come out of the medications. So it's important to review side effect profiles and catastrophic outcomes um, carefully um, before you take your examination. Um, here I've listed um, drugs that have been approved for first line um, for different seizure types. For partial seizures, remember carbamazepine, oxcarbazepine um, are really the treatments of choice in phenytoin too, but phenytoin is something we love to hate and we'll talk about it later. Ethosuximide, a favorite of examiners for absence only. It has a very narrow therapeutic window for absence. Okay. For generalized seizures, you can use valproic acid or phenytoin. And for um, ones with ha that have multiple uh, seizure types, valproic acid really is something that works very well. Phenobarbital as well. Um, and uh, usually we limit our use of phenobarbital to uh, infants and neonates, although if needed in older kids, we'll use it. Um, and primidone, not used so frequently anymore. Um, Remember, for infantile spasms, the drug of choice in general is ACTH with vigabatrin for tuberous sclerosis. And we mentioned that earlier. Okay, what drugs are there? Ethosuximide, that's the fourth time I <laughs> mentioned that. Um, so it's very effective for absent seizures. The side effects that you want to know about are GRI upset, leukopenia, and um, liver dysfunction. Um, so you want to follow the CBC and LFTs, and remember that lots of kids complain of GI upset with it. It's more common than, um, it's, it's actually extremely common to have GI upset. So you can reassure the family, or you can back off on the dose a little bit and, and um, uh, titrate up slowly if you see GI upset. Carbamazepine, what's this? Stevens-Johnson's, okay? So that's what you want to remember about Stevens-Johnson's. Uh, a question that may occur may, uh, on, on your examination may, um, may relate to the Asian population. Remember that the, uh, an HLA type has been, typing has been done on people with an um, increased risk of Stevens-Johnson's with carbamazepine, and it's, found in, um, and it's more commonly seen in the Asian population. And so you may get a question about uh, a child who is um, Asian-American who has been started on carbamazepine um, and develops a rash, or you might be asked a question of, you know, what might you be worried about, and that would be rash, okay? Remember also carbamazepine is metabolized by the P450 system, and it, that means that there are many, many drug interactions. The big ones that you want to remember about are erythromycin, okay, and oral contraceptives because it decreases the efficacy of oral contraceptives. So if you've got 
um, if you've got a question or if you've got teenagers that are um, taking, uh, that um, want to start birth control and they're taking carbamazepine, remember, you've got to tell them that, or if they tell you they're doing it for their periods, you've got to tell them that it's, the, the oral contraceptive is not going to be as effective if, you, um, if you're on carb carbamazepine. Also remember that the sodium, um, this is idiosyncratic, it doesn't happen right after you start the medication, can be decreased. Um, so you get an FIADH-like picture and that you can have increased LFTs and leukopenia. So you want to follow your CBCs and your LFTs um, as well as your, um, your sodium um, in these kids. Um, also remember, going back to what bad things might happen with the use of the medication, that um, you may see neural tube defects in 0.5% of kids' um, mothers with on carbamazepine. So all things to remember about carbamazepine. Okay, what's this? Yeah, gingival hyper uh, hypertrophy. Okay, so phenytoin is a drug we um, love to use. Phosphenitoin, phenytoin um, in emergency situations, but we don't like to use chronically. Why? Because of the hirsutism, ataxia, gum hypertrophy, and gum hypertrophy um, that can be associated with also um, uh, the teratogenic effects related to it. Um, the important thing about phenytoin to remember, and you may very well get a question on this, is the um, if you're going to get any PK questions, that um, phenytoin is zero order kinetics. And do you guys remember what that means? Okay, so what zero order kinetics means is that you it, it's basically you reach a saturation point, so the um, that you give phenytoin um, up to a certain point, and once you reach that certain point, the level of phenytoin will um, not go like this, it's not linear, that's a, a first order kinetic, but it goes straight up. And you can go from okay to toxic very, very quickly. That's the reason for not giving um, more than 20 per kilo or maybe 25 per kilo of phenytoin, because one of the significant side effects of toxicity after you reach a level of 30 to 40 is that you get seizures. There are a number of other side effects, ataxia and so on. Um, but the big one is that when you reach that saturation point, um, you're at a point of no return and you could run into big problems, okay? Um, also remember that in infants, it's very poorly um, absorbed if you're gonna, and, and that's why we don't use it in infants. You can never know what your level is doing, okay? So remember zero order kinetics for phenytoin. Phenobarbital, that is um, one of our oldest medications. Um, it's another one that we love to hate. We use it primarily in infants and neonates, and it works very, very well in neonates for controlling status epilepticus. So when you're remembering your status algorithms, remember to look at the age of the child. And if you've got a neonate that has status epilepticus, you're going to deal with your algorithm differently from if you have an older child. So in a neonate, start with phenobarbital. Okay, um, what are the problems with phenobarbital? Cognitive slowing and behavioral problems. I didn't put it up here, but it's very important to remember that rash is associated with phenobarbital. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if you, um, uh, if you got a rash question related to one of these medications, whether it's phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, or phenobarbital. Those are the big ones of our medications that cause rash. And always think about Stevens-Johnson's. So what do you want to do if a child has a rash that started four weeks ago with a medication? Tell the family to not give the next dose, okay? Don't just observe. Okay, what are some other key issues? Recently, topiramate, which um, we are using like water for headaches now, um, but is approved for generalized and focal seizures. Recently, there was a FDA warning um, which suggested an increase in oral defects of cleft lip and palate. This is fair game for your examination because it wasn't 2012, it's 2011. Um, and if you look at the prevalence, 1.4% of mothers taking um, topiramate versus 0.38% and, uh, and with other AEDs, 0.55%. So a higher um, incidence of cleft lip and palate. Um, 
Does this make a difference at the doses we use for headache? Usually we use lower doses for headache. It's not known because this is from a pregnancy registry related to, um, to anti-epileptic medications, but it's a word of warning and that may very well come up. It's actually a, a, a warning by the FDA. Okay. Um, other key issues. So I mentioned rash. Remember, lamotrigine is something that we, uh, it's actually a very good medication, but um, the, there is a high risk of rash if you increase it too quickly, and, that, and the ra rash in lamotrigine is much higher in the pediatric population than the adult population. Okay, it's, um, but it is a very good medication. The big thing to remember about is the rash. Okay, so you have monotherapy, and then you have add-on therapies for, um, for seizures. Here I've just listed what things are FDA approved for, the likelihood on your examination that you're going to be asked questions about adjunctive therapy or adjunctive therapy um, is lower, but I've listed this for you so you know that, um, so you have um, an idea of what can be used for different seizure types. And re practice is a little different from what's FDA approved. So um, you can see that um, for partial seizures, oxcarbazepine, gabapentin, and glucosamide have been evaluated and they're used very frequently for partial seizures, okay? Okay, black box warning. Remember for all AEDs, for all anti-epileptic medications, that there is a potential for suicidal ideation that came um, as an FDA warning in about 2009 or 2010. Um, so that is fair game for an examination, okay? Watch out for suicidal ideation. Okay, back to status epilepticus. <laughs> we talked about um, status um, a little bit. Um, if you get a question on status, the likelihood is it will be in a child and not a neonate. For the neonate, like I said, just remember phenobarbital, phenobarbital, phenobarbital. For your questions on status epilepticus, just like any emergency situation, you always want to remember your ABCs and to check the sugar. On your exam, you want to give oxygen and sugar, okay, and only if you've got, uh, if you're doing an exam that relates to adults, do you give thiamine, do you, do you need to give thiamine. Remember that you start with a benzo, lorazepam, or some sort of benzodiazepine. Move on to phenytoin because it's less sedating. And then remember your airway issues here, okay, and then you can move on to phenobarbital. The likelihood that you'll have a dosing question is small, but I will tell you 10 to 20 per kilo for phenytoin or phosphenytoin, 10 to 20 per kilo for phenobarbital, and then if all else fails, if the child continues to seize, first of all, this is a child that needs to go to the ICU um, and that you're not managing, you know, in the hallway anymore, right? Um, because um, then you move on to uh, a birth suppression um, kind of uh, either a pentobarbital coma or an alternative. You can do, use a midazolam infusion. There's no rule about what to use to settle the status. At this point, um, you know, you, you, one of the things that you'll want to remember for your examination is not just what drugs to give, but what you're going to do to make the child safe. And part of that is ICU management. Okay. Um, neonatal um, seizures, we talked about a little bit about the management. Remember, they're extremely common. You sneeze in front of a baby, he'll have a seizure, okay? 10% of neonatal ICU babies will have seizures, and it's not all, always because um, there is a space-occupying lesion. 10% of kids that have uh, babies that have seizures are septic. So that's your number one thing that you want to think about. And on an examination, if you're asked what to do, you always get the full septic workup in these kids and do the tap, okay? Less common causes but important are metabolic etiologies, IVH, H I uh, sorry, um, HIE is the most common that you're going to see, and sepsis is very common, um, and malformations, okay? So just remember, um, when you're working up the kid, the most important thing to think about is sepsis. The most common thing is HIE, okay? Um, febrile convulsions. You guys have seen tons of these. Um, what do you want to know about them for your examinations? 
remember how common they are, that they occur in 1 in 25, and that there um, is a positive family history, so there's some sort of genetically mediated, mediated process with febrile convulsions, um, and that um, a small percentage will develop epilepsy, and that you don't have to do an EEG. So it's a trick question if they ask what investigations you need to do, and they put EEG in there. Don't do an EEG. Um, and the other trick question that may come up with is um, one related to prevention of febrile convulsions. A mother wants to, a mother uh, says that her child, she's worried about her child having um, further febrile convulsions. Would you recommend any, uh, what would you recommend? So the important thing to know is that there have been evaluations looking at whether or not um, using um, antipyretics um, helps in prevention of febrile convulsions. Um, antipyretics make the child more comfortable but don't prevent febrile convulsions down the line. And then um, there was a question of prophylactic diazepam, diazepam use um, that was asked. And um, uh, the only thing that, result, that results in that is somnolence. Um, because you can't predict when a febrile convulsion will occur. So uh, the answer to that question is um, reassurance um, and uh, um, making the child comfortable and rectal diazepam for prolonged seizures. Remember the characteristics of simple febrile convulsions, rising fever lasting less than 15 minutes, no focal features, one in 24 hours, and six months to six years. Anything outside of this increases your risk of chronic seizures, chronic non-febrile convulsions down the line. So this is a good reason to remember this list, OK? OK, um, moving on to headaches. Um, you won't need to know a whole lot about headaches for your examination, except to know that the majority of children have some sort of a headache, report a significant headache by the time they're 15 years, and that um, migraines um, can occur quite frequently in teenagers and younger kids. Um, um, when do you want to image for headache? And these are the kinds of things that will come up on your examination. Um, there is. Um, you might get a tr trick question of, uh, with a child with a normal tension type headache. There's no need for routine neuroimaging in those types of scenarios. And remember that only 2%, about 2% of kids with chronic headaches have nervous system lesions. But the more, more likely scenario that you're going to get on your examination is if you have a child with worsening headaches. We talked about increased ICP earlier. Um, seizures, an abnormal neurologic examination, alteration of consciousness, a recent onset of severe headache and worsening of severe headache in a non headachey child, or a change in a child's chronic headaches, a change in the type of headache. Okay, these are the things that you're going to get on an examination um, asking if you need neuroimaging. A focal seizure, you guys already answered that question earlier. First, you want to look for a space-occupying lesion because the seizure is just telling you there's something there, OK? Um, but in the absence of any of these, um, you may get a question as to what to do. And you may get a whole list of different medications that you can give. Remember that the first line of therapy is a non-pharmacologic -pharma intervention. And if, you're, um, if you um, have a six-year-old child that's developed headaches and, uh, and non-worrisome examination, that you start with headache and diet diary. Um, don't restrict the diet too much. Um, and make sure that the child is eating regularly and sleeping regularly. Pretty common sense, but don't go to giving um, him or her topiramate on your, uh, on your examination, or that will be a big X, OK? Um, Non-pharmacologic management is a number one. Um, and there's not a whole lot of evidence in the literature anyway uh, about um, treatment of headache, um, except in the teenage population. Um, uh, so. Um, the likelihood that you'll get a very specific pharmacologic question about headache um, is low. Um, I've given you the guidelines, um, and the class of uh, the class of evidence is available um, within the American Academy of Neurology um, guidelines. Um, but remember, almost 
all of the studies, headache studies in pediatrics are class four. The exception to that is um, teenagers with migraines where sumatriptan um, can be used. And I am sumatriptan um, has, uh, intranasal and I am sumatriptan seem to work. Okay, and, and other triptans can be used in teenagers, not in the younger kids. Okay, we're getting towards the end. I have a list of questions. I have a few more slides on neuromuscular and demyelinating disorders. Um, and um, we'll have time to go through a few of the quiz questions um, that I have given you. Um, I'd like to leave time for a few questions as well. So we'll probably do about five of the quiz questions after we do the neuromuscular and demyelinating disorders, okay? Okay, SMA. You guys have all seen a case of SMA, I'm sure. Um, very important to recognize, and examiners love to ask questions about it. What are the important things about it? This is a kitty that is a um, cognitively intact child, and typically the scenario is that the child will have come to the ICU uh, at two, three, four months of age with a respiratory complication, intubated for something like RSV with a failure to extubate. Um, and the question might be, you know, there's a failure to extubate. It's noted that the, by the mother that the child has had poor feeding and um, poor movement, and you notice that the child is bright and alert. Okay. Um, it might, the question might then go on to say, what's the mode of inheritance, assuming that you think this is spinal muscular atrophy. Uh, remember that it's autosomal recessive, and this is another one of them, the, the, the um, chromosomal abnormalities that you should remember for your examination. Chromosome 5Q, and that genetic testing is available. And if you have a child like this um, in the ICU setting, um, it's, uh, this is when you want to test for spinal muscular atrophy. Remember that it is an anterior horn cell disease um, whose adult equivalent is ALS. Um, and like I uh, said earlier, that um, low tone and respiratory failure with a bright alert child um, is, are the hallmarks. Remember that there are three types. The one you're most likely to be asked about is the infantile form, what I just described. The child who um, has a failure to extubate, whose mother or father has noticed um, increasing respiratory uh, problems and weakness. Um, although there is type 2 and type 3, which are intermediate, and um, type 3 is kugelberg weylander they'll, they'll be later onset, and survival is better. What do we offer? Supportive care and genetic counseling. Okay, so important. If you're, gonna, if you're asked a question about SMA, remember the genetics of it, and remember, um, remember that what we offer is supportive care. Don't say that we don't offer anything, okay? <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> Okay, um, DMD, Duchenne's. Um, again, another um, favorite of examiners because it has a clearly delineate, delineated etiology, pathology, um, and pathophysiology. It happens in boys, okay? Remember that it's X-linked and autosomal recessive. Um, often families will come in and tell you what the diagnosis is because it's in the family. But in the absence of that, that's not the scenario you're going to get on your examination. You'll get a, a child with a high CK, and these kids have very high CKs, and um, um, a failure to go upstairs, increasing motor difficulties. And do you guys remember the hallmark physical exam feature? Calf hypertrophy, right? Yes. Okay, so calf hypertrophy. Remember that it is a deficiency. If you're getting a pathology pathophys uh, question, that this is one that's fair game. Deficiency of dystrophin, okay? No dystrophin as opposed to Becker's where you have some dystrophin. And that although I've written muscle biopsy here, that is not the way that we make the diagnosis. We go genetics first. Um, and if we can't make the diagnosis through genetics and we think that it's still a neuromuscular problem, then we'll go to a muscle biopsy. But for Duchenne's, go for genetic testing, okay? Um, uh, steroids have been looked at and, and are used, um, and again, supportive care. Um, myasthenia gravis is another thing um, that is less common in pediatrics but important to um, 
uh, important to recognize, the thing to re remember about it is that in the majority of cases, it's um, immune mediated and it's the juvenile form. Um, and that it is a problem of the neuromuscular junction related to the anti-acetylcholine receptor, um, uh, receptor. Um, and you can look for anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies if you have a child that presents with this. If a baby presents with something that looks like a myasthenia, the, um, the most important thing is to think about congenital myasthenia, and then the other um, the other one that you want to think about is um, that when the antibody is, when the mother has myasthenia, remember that the antibody can be transferred um, and the baby will look like he or she has myasthenia for um, up to 16 weeks. And for those babies, the antibody washes out and they do fine, but you need to watch them carefully. And what do you want to look for in those babies? Heart block, right? Okay, so remember about that with those babies. Um, the uh, exam findings um, in juvenile myasthenia gravis um, are uh, that you're going to have fatigable weakness, and that's the key to it, that it gets worse as you, as you work because the receptors get used up, okay, and neck flex, uh, flexor weakness. Tensilon test is the classical test that is done for myasthenia gravis, um, and um, you're going to treat with bridostigmine. And always remember to look at the thymus in kids if you're making the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis. So you may be asked a question about what associated testing you want to do. Look at the thymus, okay? Plasmapheresis can be useful in acute treatment, okay? Guillain-Barre is something you guys see all the time as well. And, uh, um, something that examiners love as well because it's something um, that, uh, where you can differentiate uh, between peripheral and um, central nervous system um, problems. Remember that it is a polyradiculopathy, and your exam finding is going to be severe weakness with no reflexes. Okay, reflexes are going to be zero to one. And the important things to remember are that respiratory failure is um, maybe less common in the younger kids, but when you get to the teenagers, um, but for all kids, you want to think that um, the motor weakness involve, um, can potentially involve um, the respiratory muscles, and you want to observe these kids closely um, with um, uh, pulmonary function testing to differentiate between uh, the radiculopathy uh, as opposed to a cord problem, because that may be an examin examination question. Remember that there's no sensory level associated with this, okay? Um, and on an LP, you're going to have, do you guys remember the cytoalbuminemic dissociation? What does that mean? High protein, low cells, right? Treatment is of choices with IVIG. Don't forget to treat with IVIG. Um, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis. Um, less likely to have an exam question on this, but it's uh, because it's come out. And this is my favorite thing. This is my area of specialty. Um, so I could talk to you about this for forever, but I don't know that this is going to be a huge part of your examination. Uh, remember that um, it's a, it's a post or a parainfectious process. Um, and the treatment of choice, you may be asked a question about treatment of choice. Uh, give 20 to 40 per kilo of methylprednisolone for three to five days, and IVIG may be effective. In uh, recalcitrant cases, you may uh, want to use uh, plasmapheresis. I don't think you'll get much more um, than that on it. Um, and pediatric MS, again, is a... An, uh, a more uh, frequently recognized entity. Um, it constitutes about two to five percent of MS. If you get a question on this, really you want there'll be questions regarding um, exacerbations. You want to treat with solumedrol, 20 to 40 per kilo, um, and that uh, first-line therapies have not been FDA approved for treatment but are used in treatment, and second-line therapies may be used. Okay. Okay. Don't forget about botulism. What, when, when are you going to see botulism? Unpasteurized honey, right? Okay, so there may be a history of a mother who is um, using natural foods that's given a child um, unpasteurized honey, 
remember to ask that question if the child is has constipation and generalized weakness that is acute in nature, okay? And remember that these kids come in with areflexia as well um, and ptosis. So this is, um, this is a, a favorite of examiners. So go back to your botulism and, and, and remember about that. And cerebellar ataxia of childhood, the only thing that you want to remember about that is frequently you're not going to see um, any MRI abnormalities, um, that it can be associated uh, with infection. We don't see varicella so much anymore. Um, uh, and that the ataxia is a truncal ataxia, which means the kids can't sit up well. Um, and um, you may see increased white count on the CSF. Um, uh, in terms of likelihood, you're more likely to see a question on Gambare and differentiating a peripheral problem from a cord problem um, than cerebellar ataxia. Okay, so we have time to do a few questions. Uh, um, let's do five questions, okay. and then um, you should have answers to the questions within your book, okay? Okay, first question. Okay. Mirnate presents with the findings below. There's a picture of this baby. What abnormality might you expect to see on an MRI of the brain? Okay, very good. So, Hydrocephalus is the answer. Remember with, um, so what's this condition? Um, myelomeningocele. Um, and remember that this child has a big head. You have downward herniation. You get hydrocephalus because the fourth ventricle is obstructed. And you have a Chiari 2. Okay? So it's hydrocephalus and Chiari 2. The answer is hydrocephalus here. Okay, question two. Mother comes in with her child who's been diagnosed with spina bifida. What are you going to counsel her on the risk of recurrence in a sibling? Okay, very good, excellent. Everyone was awake for that. So what about if there are two kids that are affected? 10%, excellent, very good. Child comes in with a history of increasing headaches and vomiting, complains of double vision. What might you see on your physical examination? Okay, very good. A sixth nerve palsy, and what is that? It's a false localizing sign, and what else might you see on, an, on examination if you were to use your ophthalmoscope? Papilledema, okay, very good. Okay, question four. Most common cause of CP? Okay, very good. Low birth weight pre prematurity. Again, trick question. Perinatal asphyxia is not the most common cause. Low birth weight and prematurity. You can go back to that, um, the circle diagram. Okay, question five, and then we'll move on to questions from the audience. Um, Ten-year-old child is brought in after being hit in the head with a hockey puck. He was not wearing a helmet. Shame on him. His mother reports that he had a period where he seemed fine, but has since become lethargic and difficult to rouse. On examination, you notice he's difficult to rouse. He has begun to posture, and one pupil is larger than the other. What are you going to see? What do you think you might see on CT? Okay, very good. Epidural hemorrhage. So, um, what else are you going to worry about in this child? Who are you going to call? Neurosurgery. And you might see that this child is beginning to come and he's got midline shift. Good job, guys. 